hello, Saints. Let me just adjust the volume on this. Sorry, I was adjusting the volume on this. Um, I have to talk to you about a topic that's very serious, like the others, except this one is not hardly talked about. In fact, uh, nobody likes to hear about it. But Jesus Christ talks about this place being very real and that the fires are not quenched, your thirst is never quenched. I'm talking about hell. Some time ago, I had a dream that, see, my grandfather died years ago. And he was a Catholic. But he lived for himself. He lived a very ungodly life. I'm not going to get into the specifics. But he was disobedient to God in every way, shape, and form. Sorry, you guys. So, I had a dream that um, I was in my bedroom, my master bedroom, right outside, of, right outside of this bed, right outside of this uh, bathroom, and I saw my floor like break, uh, cave in, like break in, and. What happened was, was that I saw my grandfather rising out of the floor, but inside the floor you could see like nothing but fire and souls screaming in a lake of fire. I believe that's what I was looking at, that's what I was seeing. So, anyway, there was a demon that I guess was escorting my grandfather out of hell for the moment and Jesus Christ was standing beside me. I, excuse me, let me rephrase it. I was standing beside the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's my Lord and Savior. Amen. And yours too. Sorry, Father. Anyway, I just heard him say, warn them. Please warn your parents, warn your brothers and sisters not to come here. Warn them. Tell them to give their life to Jesus Christ. Please don't come to this place. And he was pleading with me. And as soon as he was done, I can remember, he used to wear this red sweater and light beige slacks and like this light white uh dress shirt and he always had a pocket I'm sorry in his right breast pocket he always had a pen and when I saw him his sweater was burnt and so was his pants and he was burnt he looked dirty like if he was in a, uh, a coal mine and but he also looked burnt you know because part of his flesh was missing but when he came up to me he was he was uh oh sorry guys he was healed because when you're in hell, for the torture to be ongoing, you're tortured and then you re your skin's regenerated only for you to be tortured again. And that's something that you go through for eternity. You can't breathe down there. You're more hungry. Your hunger, all of your five senses, touch, smell, hunger, sight, hearing, um... So the five senses, plus your sensations, let me correct that, are magnified, whether you're hungry, thirsty, tired, you feel sleepy down there, you have to go to the bathroom, you feel sensations like that, but it's more magnified. So what happened was, I just remember the floor opening up and black vines coming up out of the floor, I counterfeit to the Lord Jesus Christ, amen, and taking my grandfather down and the demon followed him. I also remember another dream where I saw uh, my cousin Goldie's husband, Jerry, he died in 81, in 1980, he was shot in the head. I saw him in a cell burning. Um, 
Maria Noah, uh, she is a childhood friend. Her mom, I saw her and her grandmother. They were both in the lake of fire screaming. Again, because they live an ungodly life. I also, when I was in the world, I, was, I already told you I was given two warnings by Jesus Christ. The first one, I was on a train. It was dirty, it looked like a cargo train. It was bound to hell. And there was, the train cars were countless. Went way, it went miles and miles back. I couldn't even count this, how many souls that were hell bound were on there. The Lord Jesus Christ sent an angel to me saying, you don't belong here, but if you don't accept your calling of being a watchman, doing deliverance, that I was going to end up in that place. Second warning I was given by God that I told you guys about was in 2011. And that was it. I, I shut myself away from, excuse me, God freed me from the world. 2011, I saw, I was sleeping. And where it used to be my bed, my bed was no longer there. It's like I saw the floor underneath me breaking and I felt it shaking. And it was three something in the morning. And it was in the physical realm and I will never forget it, ladies and gentlemen. The Lord in the Bible says that he will remove the feet. I'm sorry, he will remove the ground from the wicked. He's not playing games. That actually happens. I felt the ground being removed from me. And I heard screams and what looked like a giant cavern, but except it was deep, deep for miles and miles. And it smelled very sulfuric, like rotting flesh. And I heard those souls screaming. And I heard a, a voice audibly say to me that either you accept your calling or you will be confined to the abyss and that will be forever. Ladies and gentlemen, I trembled before the Lord. I cried for forgiveness. I just, I didn't think twice. I served God. I gave him my everything. I haven't looked back since then. I have not had a vision. I've not had, I've had visions of hell, but not, not about me going there. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. And there are other brothers and sisters in Christ that can attest to this. You could profess to love Jesus Christ. You could say you believe in him all you want. But as far as Jesus Christ is concerned, the works of man are like dirty rags. Everything you say and do is like dirty rags. You know why? Because without faith you can't please the Father. You could say you love Jesus Christ all you want and you believe in him, but that's not gonna get you into the heavenly gates. It's not. The Bible clearly says that faith without works is dead. So faith and works hand and works faith and works goes hand in hand. Think about Abraham. He didn't hesitate at all. God told him basically, you're gonna you know, God told him basically, and I knew God, you know, God was testing him. God said to him, Give me your son as an offering. And I'm paraphrasing. If you love me and if you believe in me and if you're a sheep of mine and if you are worthy of me, you will prove it by giving your son as an offering. Abraham did not think twice. He just grabbed his son. He went up to the mountain and um, the mountain to this day is known as Jehovah Jireh. It's in the book of Genesis. Read it up. Read up on it. Um, he laid a son on the altar. Didn't think twice. He said, I love Jesus Christ. I'm willing to even give up my only son for him. God says in the Bible, if you are if you are worthy of him, you walk away from everybody, everything you know and love, you'll give it up. If you cannot give it up, that means you're not worthy of him. If you love the world more than the Father, you are not worthy of the Father. If you are comfortable with this world, the truth of the Father is not in you. Then you don't love your Father. You break one of the Ten Commandments, how can you profess to love your Father if you're living in sin? You don't love the Father. So Abraham didn't think twice. He went up to the mountain, grabbed his son. He put his son in bondage. He restrained him. And he got um, a knife. 
And he was going to sacrifice his son right there so much so. He was so determined to prove his worth to the father that God literally had to stop him and say, Abraham, Abraham, don't slay the lad. Because I know, I know you are of me. You proved it. Don't slay the lad. And then the Lord gave him a ram to offer up as an offering instead of Isaac, who was Abraham's son. And um, the works, the, the, the faith, well, I'm sorry, um, the faith comes into play when Abraham put it all in his hand. He put it all in God's hands. He had faith that um, God was going to take care of everything, that everything was going to be all right, despite the fact he was giving up his only son, he knew it was the right thing to do. He wanted to prove his worth to God. So he had faith in God that everything was going to be all right, and he was willing to do anything, faith, bold faith, to pass that test. He believed in what he was doing was right because God told him to. He gave it all to God. The work, the action, was Abraham taking action to prove his faith to God. And the action, the work, was preparing to sacrifice his only son. So you see, without faith, works is dead. So you can sit there and say, <coughs> I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. I'm sorry, you guys. Excuse me. Without works, faith is dead. So you could sit there and say you believe in God. It's not going to get you in heaven. Works alone won't get you in heaven. Because you could sit there and say, okay, I'll prove myself to God. But you could be doing the work not out of the goodness of your heart. Not because you want to please Jesus. Not because you have faith in Jesus. You could be doing it just because just you feel obligated to. Or because you feel that you just want to do it to get God off your back. Okay, you have to have faith and works and prove yourself to God. You have to constantly confess your sins. You have to repent of it. And you have to prove to God that you changed by going through the corrections that those sins can be washed away by the blood of the Lamb. A simple sinner's prayer is not going to cut it, ladies and gentlemen. You might not want to hear this, but I'm just telling you. A lot of Christians are headed to hell because they think that they're righteous. They think that they're... Um, just because they say a sinner's prayer, that's it. Just, that Jesus Christ paid for our sins at the cross and you can still continue to live in sin. doesn't work that way. Do you have a fear for the Lord? I mean, do you? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord of all? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the one that could destroy our souls of humanity and our bodies and our minds and our spirits in hell and the only one that can do that? Do you know you can't be in the presence of God if you have one spot or blemish of stain, of sin stain on your garments? You can't. Do you know to be in the presence of the Most High God, you have to be baptized in water, the Holy Spirit, and fire? Like Elijah was and the other righteous, old, right, and the other righteous prophets of old? It's in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. That's why the number's so small. That's why Jesus Christ says that Many are called, few are chosen, because many find it hard to get into the narrow gate, which is Jesus Christ. To get into the narrow gate, you have to peel yourself completely away from the world. You have to carry your cross on a daily basis. You have to deny the flesh every day. You can't live for yourself. You have to live for the Father, like it says in the book of Corinthians. That's why he died for us. He died so you wouldn't have to go to hell for your sins. And the good news is, is that you can have eternal life if you call on the name of Jesus. But through that, you call on the name of Jesus, you can you believe with your heart that He is the Lord of all. You have faith, you show through faith and works, you confess your sins, you repent of them, go through a correction so that it can be washed by the blood of a lamb. And do not come into Hebrews 10 26. You know, of having the knowledge of the sin, but you still commit it when you know it's wrong. Because if you do that, there's no sacrificial blood left to, left to wash the sin away. Because it's like you're taking advantage of the Father's grace. The Bible in the book of Romans warns against that. It's warned all over scripture. You know that hell is very real. 
Do you know that people go there every day? One soul gets in heaven, tens of thousands go to hell. <laughs> Just like the rapture. The rapture is going to be a very small percentage that's going to heaven, that's going to make it in the rapture. The majority of the world, like 99%, I'm, I'm not saying this fact, are going to, not going to make it. Just think about that. God says that a lot of people find it hard to peel themselves away from the well. They start out on the narrow path, and then their path gets wider. Because they're not living for Christ. You can't expect to be a lukewarm or backslider and profess to love Jesus. For we all fall short of the glory of God. Amen? And then when you stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, He's going to say, Get thee behind me, Satan. I never knew you. You can't expect to get into heaven with a stained gown. You can't. I can't. You have to be holy and live holy like Jesus Christ. Be holy for art thou holy. Be ye holy for thou art holy. Like the Father. You have to live holy like the Father. You can't live in sin, okay? Because hell is very real. I also had a vision that I saw babies burning there. You could sit there and say, oh, babies don't burn. You need to look in the Word of God because the Word of God talks about how when there's a wicked nation, the Lord warns that He'll send an enemy to that nation and the, and the sons and daughters, wives and husbands, and the children will be pillaged and ravished. It's in the word of God. You know why those children are pillaged and ravished? Because God knows what's going to happen before it happens. God knows if those children are going to be righteous before they even know it. Or not. And children currently that are below the accountability age. That do not know sin. At all, they do have a chance of getting into heaven. And they make it in heaven, first of all, if they're clean seed. Secondly, if God sees ahead that they're going to end up righteous. Because God knows what we're going to be before we, before we even know it. He knows what we're going to be years in the future. So the reason why those children make it in heaven is because God knows ahead of time if they're going to be righteous in their adult life, he knows how. He knows if they're going to live a righteous life before him. He knows it before you and I know it. So that's the accountability age factor, ladies and gentlemen. You can sit there and say, "Oh, children, oh, see, men, human beings are narrow-minded. They don't open their mind to the possibility that Jesus Christ knows if you're going to be righteous before you know it." So if a kid ends up in hell and they're a baby, that's because God knew that that baby was not going to live a righteous life. God knew it already. God knows the choices you're going to make before you make it. He doesn't tell you. He knows the choices you're going to make. He hopes that you make, just like I do, God, I'm sure God would like you. Not that he hopes, he would like you to make the right choice. But the sad fact about it is, God knows a person's going to make the choice, the right, cho the wrong choice before they make it. God knows everything; He sees all. Don't play with your salvation, ladies and gentlemen. Don't, because God grieves when souls go to not go down to hell. Hell is not. A place for human beings is designed for Satan and his demons. I've told you that many times. Hell is very real. You can research many testimonies. And you will notice that a lot of the testimonies are like a black cavern. Smells dingy. Smells sulfuric. Smells like fire. Smells like rotted flesh. The demons that are there. It's not a place that you want to go to. There's everlasting torment. There's misery. I can tell you my testimony, which I just shared with you, about a brief synopsis of what hell is like. Okay? 
But only it's up to you to make the right decision if you're going to serve Jesus Christ or not. Because he's coming soon. And he is not coming for a bride with spot and blemish. Okay? You don't know if you're going to die tomorrow. And I'm not wishing that. I'm wishing, I pray to Jesus Christ that you live a long life. But you don't know if when you walk out that door, that's going to be the last time. Because when you die, you're going to wake up in heaven or hell. It's as simple as that. Every soul is returned to the Father. Remember that for judgment. Immediate judgment. A judgment less than a second. So you have to decide for yourself. If you're going to do what's right for the Father, are you going to live for Him? Or are you going to live for Satan by serving sin? And think wisely, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to take the left-hand path, that's the wide path, or the right path, that's the narrow one. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is a narrow gate. And I can't force you to make a decision. That's up to you. But just know that the decision you make is going to affect you in your eternal life. 